Hi everyone. So I'm going to talk with you guys today a little bit about chapter nine and LGBTI partner abuse. So a little bit about what this chapter is going to cover. It's going to cover um, some examples that occur within this population um, and what makes it unique with this population. Um, it's going to talk about why um, having a better understanding of IPV within the LGBT population is very vital. It's going to talk a little bit about some of the um, criminal justice interventions and some of the struggles and challenges within the criminal justice system. The textbook will also talk about some of the theoretical frameworks surrounding this, so definitely take a look at some of those as well. So there's a lot of um, debate I guess, in, in the research about the prevalence of IPV within the LGBT community, mostly because um, it is significantly underreported. Um, we don't have great um, numbers to be able to um, show data for a lot of this. We do not know exactly how much LGBT I, um, individuals experience IPV, mostly because of the hidden nature of LGBT relationships. And so as more and more um, becomes prevalent in today's society, um, I think more and more information is going to be coming out. So gay and bisexual men in particular have a lot of social barriers that prevent um, others from seeing their abuse as legitimate. Um, they tend to not report IPV and they are likely to deny or minimize the abuse um, that is being perpetrated against them. Same with um, lesbian IPV. It is a, a largely hidden epidemic. Um, and so, you know, a lot of times there's a lot of reluctance to discuss IPV with um, victims. And so that may leave them isolated and, re and rejected oftentimes. Again, because a lot of the stereotypes that exist in, in today's society. So one of the big um, differences between IPV between, in, in um, heterosexual relationships versus same-sex relationship is this identity abuse and the threat of outing someone to friends, family, um, coworkers, things like that. So outing is the act of exposing someone as being gay. Um, so telling family, coworkers, a boss um, about the victim's identity, which may jeopardize their personal um, or professional relationships. Threatening to out someone can cause anxiety and inc increase the person's isolation. So we have some research that um, talks about gay men um, who have found greater satisfaction in their relationship um, are less likely to report IPV. So this study reinforced the idea of shared values and goals being integral um, in a relationship um, and having relationship satisfaction. Again, there's many similarities between IPV and heterosexual relationships and IPV, but there are some pretty significant differences. Um, mostly being that, um, again, IPV is a pattern of behaviors designed to control another person. That exists in heterosexual relationships and same-sex relationships. Um, women as well as men are capable of physical, sexual, emotional, verbal, and economic abuse and other controlling behaviors. So again, we're, you will see a lot of the same um, similarities um, between um, a heterosexual couple and a same-sex couple in an intimate partner violence relationship. Some areas also where it gets tricky is the criminal justice system. Um, Oftentimes the criminal justice system is reactive in nature and not proactive. Um, and so um, sometimes economic abuses, for example, may not be criminal offenses. And so we have to wait until a criminal offense happens before there's any type of criminal justice intervention. Again, same with emotional or psychological abuse. They may not be criminal in nature, um, even though they may be considered abusive, 
um, it's not necessarily something that, that can be a crime against someone. So same-sex reporting to the police. Um, violence perpetrated by same-sex partners can be confusing oftentimes to law enforcement. This is where um, extra training is very important for law enforcement officers. Oftentimes there's stereotypes that police officers um, kind of get, get sucked into and can be very devastating for victims. Traditionally, police officers look at gender and physical size when determining who is at fault in a domestic dispute. And so rather than falling back on the stereotypes, they really have to do some um, digging to look for a primary aggressor. Again, they, they do the same thing in um, heterosexual relationships as well. There's just um, more of a stereotype with it. So the primary aggressor is um, the person in a domestic dispute who is the most significant or principal aggressor. And so that's what police are looking for, particularly in same-sex relationships. And then finally, um, gay and lesbian victims may not have civil or criminal protections from abuse unless the definition of domestic is recognized, um, particularly in that state. And so there's um, oftentimes very few support services for LGBT um, I survivors. Um, there's very few shelters or hotlines that exist. Um, so that's definitely, there's definitely several legal issues that um, LGBTI survivors um, struggle with oftentimes. So this is a little overview of the chapter for this week. As always, if you have any questions, um, please feel free to reach out. Um, thank you guys so much.